so first, thank you for joining me today. Um, yeah. I definitely, as I was curating the list of people to bring on my show, I'm like, who are dope, cool, not just, because I want to have discussions across the board with different Black creatives, thought leaders, you know, people that are really just doing work in various fields. Mm -hmm. um, but our work at Adolescent is very much tied to the creative and enabling oh. young creators. So I was like, and the kids, like, when I think of that, like, you're definitely in that bucket of young people who are working. Mm -hmm. um, but you're still, like, seasoned enough to kind of, like, have a fresh perspective that a lot of our Gen Z users and um, viewers could definitely, like, learn from a game. Mm -hmm. Um, so my first question, just to jump this thing off, is as I've been having conversations with other creators and other people within the industry, um, as of now, as of today, like, there is so much more like vocabulary and like terms to kind of help identify like what you want to be. Mm -hmm. But like, because we're not we're not that far apart in age. I think you only like a few years, maybe a year older than me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know you. Know, but, but obviously, growing up, there wasn't like content creators there were all these like these cool like right. words that we have now right. for what we do mm -hmm. um so at what point did you even realize or even like, i guess the idea that certain things were jobs you know growing up you have like i'll be a doctor a lawyer oh, right. like, no one's oh, ever, I, like television writer i say that all i say this all the time i didn't like screenwriter i had no idea that word existed i don't know what i don't think i learned that word until maybe late high school like i still you know <laughs> I, I just knew that from watching, okay, so I remember watching East by You and being like, oh, I want to, like, I don't know what this is, but I like this. And then, you know, I was obsessed with um, Journey Smollett's monologue in East by You. And so I'm like, can we rewind it? Can we rewind it? I just keep asking my grandma, my poor grandma. She's like, okay, girl. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm like, dang, like, how, what you know I'm trying to figure out what this even is you know what I mean because you know as a kid the concept of an actor just pretending you just thinking like this is a real thing but I just really liked it and I learned about actors and I learned you know oh it's it's pretend somebody makes this and I'm like okay well I want to I don't know what it's called but I knew I wanted to be the person that made, made it made movies um, and then, so as I got a little older, I started diving into like poetry and like writing and short stories and stuff like that. Because even, I think um, even like, to your point, as a kid, you do have the context of like writers, but like you think of books or like right. literature, exactly. these are exactly. writers. So I was like short stories or poems or whatever. So I knew that I really liked writing poems and short stories. And then I also really liked watching movies. And I was like so obsessed with movies and TV. Um, so I just didn't know how to merge or marry the two. So it wasn't until I got a little older and then I started doing theater in my, um, in my high school. I did a play. I wrote it. I co-produced it with like one of my classmates. Come on, production And it was a hit. I mean, everybody was like, oh, this is so good. I was like, thank you. And it wasn't until my theater teacher mentioned like playwrights and then she mentioned screenwriters. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> And so she gave me all the tea and I was like, oh, and so after that I did, like, I was just so obsessed with learning more about what that meant. And then, you know, I went over. No, definitely. I think even for me, like, I grew up in performing arts and doing, like, theater and stuff. Uh -huh. But even for me, like, I knew the context of, like, writing and, like, scripts and directors yeah. in, in terms of, like, theater. But it yeah. still, for that reason, didn't, like... It didn't it, connect. It, you just, know like, it. No. But even then, like, growing up, like, I guess I started performing arts in, like, first grade. So, to me, I, I like the performance aspect of it. Yeah. But then, then you notice, like, it's so weird. Like, you see stuff in retrospect as an yeah. adult. And, you're, like, as a kid, I, I definitely enjoyed the creative, like, the production of this. The then, and I was doing those things. didn't realize that's what I was doing. Like, I like right. to write, write exactly. these scripts or whatever. Not realize I'm trying to be a yeah. director or writer or like, whatever. It, it, it really also my obsession with like when I was younger playing The Sims was really just screenwriting like I was so obsessed with making these characters I was so obsessed with like how they were gonna live their life and then when, once I got older I was like oh I was like literally I was obsessed with that and like the things that I'm obsessed with always fall back to like screenwriting and filmmaking like once you connect the dots and my mom was like yeah you wouldn't do anything else like you were like oh she's gonna be an Aquarius <laughs> I'm dead. I would change their hair. I'm like, she's gonna marry this person. They're gonna have this many kids. Like, I was just so obsessed. And so, yeah. No, definitely. You definitely notice those things much more as an adult. Um, so, around what age do you feel like you got the epiphany? Like, okay, I can be a writer. This is what I can do. Like, this is the actual career choice. Um, 
well, I guess once I had a word for it, it made it real for me. So maybe, I don't know how old I was. I don't know if I was like 14 or 15. Okay. Um, but I've always been in the arts like you. Like I've always, well, mostly like dancing and music and stuff. Exactly. Like that. So, but I didn't, you know, because I didn't know it was a term. But when you make something real, it becomes like, now it's in your mind. So it was, I think it was about 14, 15 when I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do for sure. And I've definitely had like, I had a conversation with someone recently um, for the show and talking about just even the importance of that, like exposing kids to that vocabulary to help them understand those things and see yes. those things. Yes. Um, I feel like I'm, that's one of my privileges in life. I think like, I think back to my life, like having such exposure to certain like elements of the arts and not just on the surface level, but having like teachers yes. and stuff that really kind of, like you said, showed you those different pockets within those career yeah. choices. Yeah. Um, so, of course, I feel like people, all people know you, kind of know you. I, although you're a writer, you have this huge enterprise, as you could say, damn right, originals. Yes. It's literally, and I think, and you kind of describe it as a screenwriting label, right? Mm -hmm. That's, and I'm like, so did you, I feel like you kind of coined that term. I've never heard anyone else use I think that I did phrase. Too, you know, I, like, if I ever hear somebody else say it, I'm going to be like, mm. <laughs> But like, I'm like, no, the kid said that first. I said it first. said it first. I said it first. But no, I, I, I think it was because people kept at first people, you know, and I think we even in the very beginning may have said like production company or whatever, because like, that's the, like you said, language is important. That was the language that we had. And then when people started to say like, oh, can you turn my script into this or do this or cameras, this and that, I'm like, we don't have none of that. Like we just have script. <laughs> and I was like, okay, Nate, I need to go back and like, name this something else so that people can understand what this is and so I thought about like the structure of it and how I wanted it and I thought about like the music industry and I'm like okay well then they have labels um and then you have your artists and then the artists release music and so I was like okay so I want a, a label then I'll have our artists who are the writers and then we, we just like make our scripts and then we can you know license license to a production company or platforms who fund us and then we can make those scripts into you know team up with some people who have a production company and make those scripts come to life but mostly like our music is our scripts like we don't have no cameras and no nothing and i think what's interesting about that is the idea that if you come just based on how you describe it you would think it's an agency in a way but i think the, dip, the key difference is the fact that you are a writer creative where a lot of right. times your agent is an agent they right. don't necessarily understand the creative right, right. right. They, they want you to get this thing but like you come from with the like you say like i'm like music industry you have like your industry or a and r people your songwriters mm -hmm. that are kind of like curating the actual like project in the art right um, so at what point what, what did you even like come to this idea like cause obviously you know I know. You, well, you probably did. You just wake up one day and like, you know what? Let's just go ahead and do this. We're gonna like, I so I'm Shook Knight, and we finna <laughs> take over, take over the industry. No, so I had a um, so in college I had a, a poetry group called um, You Damn Right, and so it was a website. I would release like my poems. I released other people's poems like anonymously if they wanted like people who were maybe shy about it but like were really good writers. I would just release some online. People could comment, people could like see new artists, stuff like that. Um so as I but but at this point I knew I wanted to be a screenwriter because I was in college but I was just doing like my poetry stuff as a like creative release. And then so once I graduated college, um I was like, okay, so now I got to like start making films. I got to just start. I can't wait for anybody, you know? And I was like, I need somewhere to house my work. And I was like, well, maybe you damn right. And I was like, no, it's already known for like poetry. And I literally was just like, well, I'm just going to do damn right. And I was like, hmm, it needs to sound official. Then I was like, original. <laughs> and it was no real like God came to me in a dream. Literally, I was just like, hmm, damn right. Okay, official originals damn right originals and i mean sometimes it comes like sometimes it's literally that simple though i feel like as artists sometimes we can't overthink it it's like no yeah. it has to be this perfect thing so the world hears it people are like oh what was the moment when you came up with the name like how was it i'm like girl it wasn't even that deep it was no. like i already kind of had this thing and i just had an extension of it and i was just like i was more so ready to do the work and i think a lot of people are um they overthink the optics of things and they're just like you know let me like do I mean obviously I did make a website and all that good stuff but I was more so ready to work I was like okay okay that's the name what am I doing you know what I mean because you have people who have a whole website with no, no words. Words. and I'm like 
how that don't that doesn't make any sense. First of all, I get it. Brandon is listen, I get Brandon. I get it. Um, so I did my my logo and all that stuff. But guess what? I didn't do that until I, I like was done writing my first script, like outside of school, like my first personal script that I was gonna produce. I did that first before I even announced like the name of my company and all of that good stuff. Cause so because technically it was started in 2013, but like you'll see on record that it'll say 2014 because that's when I, you know, was like, okay, now I have something, some work to go with it. Like, don't, you guys, don't, you, people, we get so excited, and I get it, but, like, just do the work. <laughs> I wonder if also that's almost, because, you know, they, I always see on, like, Instagram, because Instagram is, like, the new, like, hub for, every, for information. But um, I saw a post one time, like, almost talking about, like, how sometimes we self-sabotage in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those things, like, procrastination, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. you think about, I'm just procrastinating, just procrastinating, but it's really, like, you're avoiding the actual work in a way. So I want to redo yes. that, like, like you said, we, we do so much work for like the branding, the optics, but yes. we're really scared to start actually doing the actual work. Cause look yeah. at that and, and then the branding and the optics, you get so many, like you get so much endorphins from like seeing people say, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Oh my God, look at this logo. Oh my God, look at your website. Oh my God, look at your Instagram page. And then you feel accomplished, but you really haven't done shit. Like you, you feel like, Oh my God, I did all this stuff, you know? So you kind of relax in that. And it's like, no. Did you actually do Did anything? Did you really do the work yet? Yes. Yeah, so. I mean, if anything, now you're a web designer. I mean, if that accounts for anything. <laughs> right. This is true. Brighter side. Look at the brighter side. Um, one thing I really love about Damn Right, I think, and that's I admire, admire about you, is the idea that it's independent creation mm -hmm. in that process of really like, because again, going back to the same thing about doing the work, a lot of times as creators, young creators, we're waiting for like this big break, we're waiting for somebody to, to co-sign this. Yes. But I feel like I've like I've seen through you the idea of like just this is what I want to do. I want to write these scripts. Okay, this now I'm gonna like, keep this train going. I'm gonna build this up as I go. And yeah. it's almost like building an airplane. We we ain't in the area, but I'm gonna keep building until we fly in. Yeah. Um so what what is that what, what has that process been like for you? And also just like what have you learned through independent creation? Um I've learned that it's very fulfilling. Um, honestly, like I get, I, it's a very odd thing that we just need these specific people or groups or brands or networks to acknowledge us and like uh, verify that we are good or, you know, just to make us feel like we've actually made it, which I totally, I get it, I'm a creative too, but, um, I think that it's so much more fulfilling to like prove to yourself that you can do something um, with what you have. And so I think that process was just like, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fake the funk and act like, you know, if Netflix or you know, HBO call me like, Hey, we want X, Y, Z, or can you come right for us? I'm, I'm not going to fake it and act like I'm going to be like, Oh my God, my right. own. I'm like, going to be like, I'm already here. I'm, I'm here already. I'm early. <laughs> I'll just camp outside. <laughs> um, but I think that it's very important that in your process of waiting that you continue to create on your own because um, it, it'll just get so, it'll become a burden if you, like I think, what, who was it, Maya Angelou who said like, um, she said like, it's nothing, it's the saddest thing is like uh, a story untold or something like that. It's like if you're just carrying all of these stories or all these projects and all of these ideas and you're not putting them out there because you're waiting for somebody or something to give you that permission or validation, then you'll be you'll become depressed because you have all of these ideas and then you'll start seeing everybody else with their great ideas and be like, oh, I have ideas too. Just go ahead and put them out. Just go ahead and do them, you know, with your friends. It'll just be fulfilling and it'll be so much worth it. And then it's your way of like, it's your way of showing, hey, like, this is what I can do without much funding. This is what I can do without much resources. Like, I'm creative enough to do this, so I, you should hire me. You know what I mean? Definitely. That's what happened in 2018 when I did a short film a month. I was just like, I'm going to do a short film a month because I think before then I was putting out work that was, like, dramatic only. It was, like, dramas. But I'm, I love comedy, and I love, like, horror i love all genres to be honest i was like well i don't want people to pigeonhole me so let me do a short film a month of all these different genres so people can know like i have range you know what i mean if they want to hire me if they want to work with me and so that's what i did for myself and that ended up giving getting me an opportunity to get a development deal you know with the network and then to get a licensing deal with the platform so 
and that was unintentional. That was just me just right. like, want to create. So, I mean, I feel like good will come out of just creating while you wait. No, definitely. I did an interview with um, James Blaine, who did the Giant series. Oh, yes. I, I, and he, I love it. he said something about, um, he thinks, he said, like, dang, what's he saying? Like storytelling, like I, I might be misquoting this, but um, storytelling, like filmmaking, is like a creative sport in the sense you have to be in the gym. Like, how you in the gym for yeah. basketball? The same you way you're in the gym, like, you gotta be, you gotta create, you have to work, yeah, because yeah, nothing's worse than you wait and then HBO do call you, like, hey, we got this show, we want you to develop, and I'm not prepared, right? Because I've been, I, I wasn't shooting in the gym because I'm not prepared, yeah, absolutely, it prepares you for bigger things and um, it's just nothing will be new to you. And then if you work on that, um, cause it's so much hard, it's so hard. So like when you do it on your own, um, it kind of builds up your, you know, like you just kind of get this like thick skin and you kind of get tougher in a sense, like mentally, cause you got to always pivot. It's like always a pivot with filmmaking. Something happens and you always have to learn to pivot. So if you've already been practicing doing that, cause you've been making your films, cause you've been writing your scripts, it's nothing when you get in a room. It's nothing when you get on set. Cause it's like, oh, I've done this with no money. So like, let's go. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, for you, I guess, as a writer, myself, you know, you, and even if you start creating stuff, we have a vision of what it will be like in our heads. Mm -hmm. We have like the grandest, when you're writing, you're like, that's your playhouse. You can uh -huh. build anything. Yeah. But then there's a moment where you're like, oh, okay, now I can actually make this thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanted us to do a scene where the car flies off the freeway and explodes, but we don't got that kind of money. <laughs> so we gonna do so, the car gonna swerve and we gonna cut out. <laughs> <laughs> so as an independent writer, and um, producer, like how do you make those, like how do you still get your vision across but still make accommodations based upon where you are? Um, like I just said, like literally like you just, if it's a, if it's something that I'm like, no, I have to have this, then I won't do the project, I will, I will wait for that particular project. If the project requires something grander than I have at the moment, I'm not gonna, I'm going to wait. I'm going to try to get funding for that one. And I'll probably try to, or I'll do a smaller version of it to get the funding, if that makes any sense. Um, but like I said, you know, filmmaking is a pivot. Screenwriting is a pivot too. Like it's been times where, you know, I've had to like, oh, this, this, you know, um, actress couldn't make it today da, da, da. and she was like had the bulk of the the you know the lines and i'm like okay <laughs> this is important so i have to like quickly rewrite like everything if you learn how to pivot like that is probably the most the the best characteristic you can have as a filmmaker as a creative is to learn how to pivot i couldn't like i could easily have been like oh my god how dare she not come or show up or i didn't have time for that i was like okay sis, are you okay are you safe yes okay great we need to change the script no, that definitely reminds me of <laughs> when I <laughs> when I was in high school. We did a, a, a like the seniors would do like show every year, uh -huh. um, and as a junior, me being me, I didn't tag along to the, the senior show. Like, well, I'm about to just, <laughs> I'm about to just take over this thing, and they were doing like a Dream Girls like interpretation, and I'll never forget one of the girls was in it. She, that whatever like the moment before the the show, her boyfriend break up with her, and she's like crying in the middle of the cafeteria, like just. She don't want to do the show. She's like my boyfriend. Like you, I'm obviously it's high school. You so it's like everything is on thirty. Yes. Melodramatic. <laughs> and everybody's like, "Oh my god, what's going on?" What's going on? I'm like, "Me, I'm like, okay, so you doing this part? You got this show line? Yes. You know this part? Okay, like we got to keep this thing going." Uh -huh. I mean, luckily she she uh, got herself together. But I think to, to your point, you have those instincts as a kid. Like, okay, we have yeah. to we have to change. Like we can't. The show's going on. The show yeah. has to happen. People yeah. are coming. Yeah, and people like I'm like okay, well, are we gonna cry? And it's you know what? It takes a special person to be honest because I have seen, and then not to take away from them because I have these are some great people, but I've seen some great people really just shut down at the smallest inconvenience. In inconvenience, and I'm like, you really have to learn how to take your emotion and your ego out of something so that you can get the job done. Like literally, you just have to, or you're, you'll, it'll de debilitate you moving forward. Cause it's always going to be something. It's always going to be something. You got to learn how to, you know what I mean? I think that's definitely like from like, just even like, you like, I, I keep having this conversation. Like it's like hindsight, all those things that lead up to you being who you are. Like I remember like my first play I ever did in school, yeah. my first line I ever got, my first speaking role was somebody else's role. Oh, but the, wow. boy, the boy didn't show up. And you were prepared. And they were like, who knows? Does anybody know the line? I said, I know the line. <laughs> exactly. I know the lines. 
So like, I guess like you, like, and that's like me, like first grade me. So I'm like, what, six, seven? Oh, so you like, crazy. you see, I get nothing just through like being in the arts and like that. You see like directors have to make that choice. Like the show's tonight. We can't stop the show because one yeah. person needs to be the accommodations. And you kind of, I guess you instinctually internalize that in a way. You take, take in like the sponge, all those experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, you kind of said something earlier, which you talked about like just with your short, every short month mm-hmm. and showing your range as a, um, writer and one of the things I had thought about like I thought about that when I was coming from my questions and we see a lot of times where people kind of pigeonhole black writers or black stories so they're like we do these, these very specific types of shows like you look at black shows they're always in certain pockets um <laughs> what I mean and sometimes whether the content is good or not it's just like after a certain point it's okay like, can we do something else yes um, one of the things I really love that you guys did, I can't, the title is stuck in my mind, but it's like the zombie apocalypse. Oh, Eleven Forty Five. Yeah, yeah, Eleven Forty Five. <laughs> and I'm like, like just seeing that, like we never see. Apparently, every time something happens, black people are are, are around, whether we're in the future, like it's anything, black people are It's like damn, when there's a zombie apocalypse, ain't no more black people. <laughs> when when we in the future in thirty thirty, ain't no more. I'm like damn, where we go? Where do we go? We just disappear. So can you um, talk about just, I guess, yeah. you kind of talk about the, the importance of you showing your range. We as a storyteller, can you talk about just the importance of diversifying, like, and showing Black faces and Black voices and those different things? And also, what is your through line as a writer? So when you're writing comedy, science fiction, what is your through line as a kid that you always bring to each of those things? Okay, through line is very simple. Authenticity. Like, I, I want it to be real. Um, I don't even care if it's I don't care if it's, we're in outer space. Like, I don't care where we are, what the story is. I want the people to emotionally be attached. And it don't have, it can be horror, it can be comedy, it can be drama. That's always my goal is to be emotionally invested. I don't care what emotion. You can be mad, you can be sad, you could, you could be happy, you could be laughing. Some kind of emotional attachment to whatever you're watching. That's like my goal when I'm writing. Um, as far as range or like diversify. So like, here's the thing. People sometimes get caught up in diversity of looks on screen. And it's like, yes, you have Black people. Yes, we have Black people. But what are they doing? I think people need to diversify their stories, diversify your characters. Like, are we always the same character? Is the story very basic all the time? Um, so that that was like one of my thoughts. I was like, well, let's like, let's, especially with the zombie apocalypse, I was like, I love horror. I love like um, Walking Dead. Like I, I'm obsessed with the Walking Dead. Um, and so I'm like, I want to talk about zombies. But like, black people can be included in that. I think people automatically like, oh, well, we're doing sci-fi. We're doing whatever. We're doing this. Well, black kids can't be in that. Or, or black women can't necessarily be in that. And that's because they've never seen it. But that's never my thought. I'm always like, how can I put black people in like a diverse story setting? Like what can I, what else can I do with black people? That's like always my goal because I, because I want to see it personally, you know? And I think um, anytime you add that layer to it and, not, and also without the, I guess the story centering around just them being black, like that's not yeah, the story. That's not, it's not a story. <laughs> but that layer of like culture Changes the, the dynamics of the story because mm-hmm. black people approach oh, things in different ways, so absolutely. it makes the story more interesting absolutely. or give a different perspective or different things. Like black people in a zombie apocalypse is very different, right? <laughs> we're not going to go check on that. What is that? <laughs> no, no, we're not going. That's why they said they joke and say we're not going to last in a horror movie. A horror <laughs> movie would not last in a horror movie. But the horror movie wouldn't be. Fun because we would be like, uh, uh-uh, lock the doors, and that's, that's it. Right. That's the end of the movie. <laughs> but I think as storytellers, that challenges you to say, okay, that's that is a true that statement. A true so, how do we tell this story? Right. So, it's like now we have to make it unavoidable, and now you have to be authentic. So, I'm not going to write something where we're going to go to the door, we're not going to go outside, we're not doing that. So, now I got to bring the monster in the house. Now, what do we do? You know what I it mean? It sounds to me as you saying you have to actually do the work as a writer and tell a new you story. Have to, you have to do the work. I think it's a new concept. <laughs> <laughs> no, no definitely like right I, I think we always talk about as right like raising the stakes the stakes yeah. have to change yeah. when you introduce new people into these different dynamics absolutely um so as black people as people are part of the black diaspora yeah. um one of the things that we carry with us is like the traditions of griots or storytellers mm-hmm. um so what is the what do you think is the importance or the role of storytellers now in this age that we live in 
Um, I feel like storytellers and storytelling has like this like deep, important history. Um, Cause we didn't always have books. We didn't always, or access to, to books or, you know, something we could write down. Um, so like oral storytelling was a way of, you know, communicating, you know what I mean? Um, and so I think that's is super special because um, you have this like sort of like responsibility and, and like you have this like hierarchy in the community, not in a way of like ego, but like you are looked after as somebody who has these stories and who holds the history of time or, you know, things of that nature. And so that's not lost on me, you know, and, and I try to take that into my work. I'm like, okay, what can I do today to document the times or to make sure that people know X, Y, Z. So wait, so Sister Soldier wrote, I, I, I can never remember it by heart, but Sister Soldier wrote in The Coldest Winter Ever, not The Coldest Winter Ever, I'm sorry. Um, what is the other one? Midnight. She said like the storyteller um, is, has the second most important job after God. Because like we can, con we literally can control what people know, what people feel, okay. you know, and it was like, you have this responsibility. And I was like, oh, like she says, she obviously wrote it more eloquently than I can like re repeat. But I was just like, that is so, like, that really changed my perspective on things. And I was like, wow, I do have this responsibility of telling these stories because these are images that are going to be imprinted on people's minds and like words that people are going to to take in whether they think they are or not like we literally we like subconsciously like listen to things we remember images etc um so I, I do definitely think that storytelling is important and um like just being very responsible of like what kind of stories we choose to tell so what do you think is the balance especially in these times now of us because the sense you know they always have the, they have the saying that art reflects life in a way <laughs> Mm -hmm. So with, with, for us as Black people and Black storytellers, what do you think is the balance between us reflecting the Black traumas and the Black, the things that are really happening to us in that yeah. way, but also balancing <laughs> with Black joy and Black, all the other things that we experience within the, the yeah. um, depth of our life experiences? Well, I think as far as Black trauma, I think that it's so, I think for some reason that it's just, it's this thing, it's like, people are obsessed with black trauma at this point. And obviously it, it exists and it, need, it does need to be documented so that we don't forget. Um, however, like, I think I said this the other day, I, I think I tweeted it or whatever, but I was like, like black stories don't have to be seasoned in trauma in order to be good or in, in order to, you know, let me like have some sort of, some sort of like high standard. Like it was this, um, it was a call for, for filmmakers. It was like, hey, filmmakers, we want to support you. We want to give you funding. Send us your stories about civil rights and police brutality. And I'm like, how convenient is that? You want to fund stories about police brutality and civil rights. But you don't want to fund stories that can, like, show more of our humanity to people because that's obviously what we're doing. Right. Like, I'm, that, I'm, in a way, that's, like, almost like we have these issues because people we don't see our humanity, but we're only showing the only other part. Right. I'm just like, can we, and it starts there, like everybody needs to diversify their thought when it comes to black storytelling, everybody. And I'm just like, like find more stories about um, us just having fucking fun. Just, you know, just doing anything. It's so many stories with non-black people just doing whatever and having a good time with their friends. like. Okay. Well, we don't. Well, we don't have good times, Nikia. We don't have friends. good times or friends, or we don't have lovers. We don't have. We don't have, we don't have any of that. If we only have trauma. Because I mean, I mean, even you think about I guess the history of cinema. I was listening to a podcast and they talked about like the several different archetypes that black characters were being. I can't think of all of them right remember now. The first I remember, one, that, like, remember the first film? Uh, Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation. Look how that has like that literally affected how like the the fear of black people even more it deepened that fear of black people just from that film from those visuals and you, you, you know what i mean like that's how powerful images and stuff then this is like goes along with what you're saying about the history of filmmaking so we started with trump like literally started our images started in trauma and that's how <laughs> you no definitely so okay even to that point uh jumping off that you have 
it's still a conversation here and there, but I feel like it, it depends on who you're talking to in your circles and obviously. But, um, you know, I think historically we've had people like who criticize like um, the Cosby show because they felt like it wasn't a true depiction of like black people in a way because there is, I guess there isn't, no, there's a struggle in a way or they're too perfect. Or even <laughs> looking at someone, a character like Claire Huxtable who has, who seems too perfect. She's too together. So what are, as a writer, what do you feel like you, I guess you... I think when people say that, that's their personal traumas, that they have to, like, you got to let stuff go. Like, it's, I get it that everybody's life wasn't like that, but some people's life were like that. And the thing is, it's like the, the fact that it's, okay, so here's the problem. We have so little Black stories being told that the few film, Black filmmakers who are, have kind of made it through get this huge burden to tell every black story there is. And I don't think that that is the, we shouldn't put the pressure on them to tell all of the black stories. We should just welcome more black filmmakers to, to cover these black stories. I think the Cosby show was definitely needed. One, because it does depict somebody's real life. Maybe they didn't have the, like their struggles were different from our, or from, you know, maybe lower class black people. Like it just looked different, but their struggles look like something else. You know what I mean? Their struggles look like, um, What's one of the episodes? Something crazy happened. I was just thinking about it. It's just different struggles, right? And so, but it still needs to be shown. Um, one, because it tells you, like, this is, you know, if you can possibly aim to be this way if you want, you know what I mean? And it gives you maybe some sort of hope if that's the type of format of family that you want to create. Like, right. I don't think that it's a problem with it. Um, but we literally, we also had good times. You know what I mean? And people talked about that. Like, oh, right. they, they, everything, too poor. Was a, everything was so poor. Everything was a problem. I'm like, that's their life. They were, that's their mindset. And, and they were poor and they were in the projects. And they, like, those are the struggles. And those are the, like, your people are, sometimes, like, their environment really contributes to how you live and act and think. And so, like, these are different classes of Black people. Like, I think that it's fine. It's a story. Do you think people have an issue with, writers writing flawed characters because they don't like to see themselves reflected on screen in that way um probably I, well i don't know because I, I maybe i'm biased because i love seeing flawed characters i agree but i feel like there's always conversations of like there are certain things that i feel like as in, within our community we don't like to see about ourselves mm -hmm. and, and and when i think as writers your job is to kind of sh show that we especially want, people always want three-dimensional characters or four characters okay well, these characters have to be they're not perfect Right. Um, so you can't have, like, one thing I love about, like, we talk about Viola Davis as um, Emily's Keating on How to Get Away. Mm -hmm. She's this strong woman who has this, yes. this power, but we have to juxtapose that with other things. She's falling apart internally. She has all right. these things. She has all these other issues and trauma. Yeah. She can't be But that goes all that's things. human. Like, nobody's innately fully good or fully bad. Or, you know, like, we have, like, these flaws. We make a very questionably, like, questionable uh mistakes or you know we do some crazy stuff like if you think about all the like maybe some shady stuff that you've done and you're like oh i don't know i don't want nobody to really find that out like you know what i mean everybody has like a thing or two that they said that they probably shouldn't have said to somebody they've hurt somebody's feelings probably purposely non-purposely like, like this is a part of like being a human being you know what i mean and the fact that we get to see care we get to see them in these moments nobody gets to see us by ourselves when we're doing crazy stuff or when we're thinking crazy stuff or when we're being jealous or envious we're never gonna say like the things that we really think you know what i mean but in filmmaking and in television we get to show that we get to be a part of that definitely and i think that that's brilliant i think that it does it shouldn't make people shun away from that it should make you feel a little bit better like okay this is a beautiful smart black successful woman and she still has these flaws so like i don't feel like success or you know intelligence is far from me because i'm also flawed like i can be both of these things they're not mutually exclusive you know what i mean i love i say that all the time love juxtaposed characteristics i have hella juxtaposed characteristics i mean everybody everybody does <laughs> like people just want you to be this one thing and i'm like that's not real life at all it's not um, that's, I think that's one thing I really loved about the most recent season of Insecure, where they are like breaking down these characters. We've we've known them a certain way, but now we're kind of really looking at those interpersonal relationships and those yes. little things mm -hmm. that aren't so good about them in a way. Like yes. we're really face to face with those. And even for me as a viewer, I was like, ooh, 
Right. I, I've never real. before. <laughs> you know what? Somebody tweeted. It, it made me be like, ooh. Somebody tweeted and was like, um, I think when Molly had dismissed her uh, assistant or something, she was like, I don't pay you to to get mad. She said something like, I don't. I, I don't pay you to like make me not make mistakes. I don't pay you to make yeah. me look stupid or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then the person like tweeted and was like, damn, she didn't have to be so mean or rude to her. She was so nasty. Everybody's like, yeah, she is just a bitch. Da-da-da. And in my mind, I was like, I really didn't see anything wrong with that. And so I was like, dang. Like, well, I thought like that was a debate too. People like you see those different. One thing I love about even just the community around that show is you see on Twitter people having discussions about those things and the characters. Yeah. And I think as a writer, you kind of want that you create these dynamic characters and people get to see them kind of go up against each other and the audience can decide what was right, right. what was wrong. And you, yeah, so I, I like that too. But it definitely it makes you think about your own self and how you would react. And Because I told her, it was like, I mean, what was wrong with that? She don't pay her to make her look stupid. Like, <laughs> you know, but my friend sitting next to me is like, how did you say that? I'm like, yikes like am i am i mean like am i rude so it definitely um like holds a mirror up to yourself for sure definitely um so one thing that you both have in common is that we are both natives of atlanta georgia hey, a beautiful hey. black city yes um so how has being from atlanta growing up in atlanta influenced the way you tell stories or the way you see like the depth of blackness when you tell stories um I just think like Atlanta has this flavor of like we just have so much culture from our music to our dress, our our fashion over the decades, to our slang, to our um just like how we rep different parts of Atlanta. It's like so it's just such a it's just a culture in itself. And so I love when I get to like I'm working on a project now where I didn't even really say where they were from, but I was like, oh, they, they definitely have to be from Atlanta because they're just talking like it. You know what I mean? Like the slang, everything is just very, the swag of everything, very Atlanta. Um, and so it definitely has shaped my storytelling when it comes to that. And, and then when I tell, like, for instance, when I did Sugar Water, it was so fun because I basically could just go back to, and that's a coming of age story about some kids in the 90s in Atlanta. I really just went back to my childhood and I got to shoot in my childhood neighborhood in Washington Heights. And I was just like, oh, I get to talk about the candy lady. I get to talk about how the you candy know, lady. I'm I was- gonna make you break, like play her lottery numbers. It's like, I'm not even old enough. I'm not supposed to be doing this, but <laughs> like, we're gonna run to the store and do it. So it's like so much culture in growing up in Atlanta um, and in the evolution of the culture to like today, you know? So it, it's been great. Like, I love. I love using elements of people that I've experienced in Atlanta in my stories or, or some of the swag or language, and, you know, just culture. I'll reference food. I always, I probably always reference lemon pepper wings because I'm obsessed. <laughs> Even though I'm a, I'm a full-time pescatarian now. Last year I was part-time pescatarian. Thanks to quarantine has helped me become full-time. I'm screaming. Man. <laughs> no, I think, um, I love to see just different artists it's like really reflect their like cities on screen um yeah. i love like even like with us like we had like obviously growing up here like atl come out that was a big thing yeah. for the city yeah. and even now with, like donald glover's um atlanta yeah like just showing that that um perspective on the city yeah. and then other people like i love lena waves the shot like how they kind of create this yeah. in the city and show their culture yes like, although we're all interconnected as like but we have these individual cultures from our different Absolutely. cities Absolutely. that definitely influence how we see the world Yes, absolutely. Um, so you know, I was I was stalking your Instagram. Oh God! And I saw your story. You had asked, had asked people what was the best advice you have given them. Uh huh. <laughs> so what's the advice? Best advice you have been given? Hmm. The best advice. And also the worst advice you've been given. You think? Ooh. So I can't. I think that hmm, I would have to really reflect. But I'll say the best advice I've been given. Um. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so two pieces of advice I've been given within the last few months that that's still on my mind right now is one of my mentors said, um, he was like, um, don't, don't move to LA and make LA make you become a waiter, meaning like waiting um, for something to happen, which I, I, like I had to, I was like, first of all, but I really had to think about it because in Atlanta, I was such, I was just doing so much. And I was like, oh, you know, let me put this out, let me put this out, let me put this out. And now I think when people come to L.A., um, 
we start to obviously we start to shift to try to go into more um creatively uh, corporate spaces you know like trying to get to that the, the writer's room and stuff like that so now you've shifted from independent which is so much hustle and grind to like trying to be in these rooms and so it kind of slows you down on your own independent front and then you start to do other things and so i think he recognized that and he, and he just said that to me and that just it hit it struck me because i'm just like dang like okay i don't want to become somebody who's not still doing because like that's my biggest thing like i tell people right. continue to do your creative work so um I just, yeah, so that was a piece of advice that I took. And then to piggyback that, somebody else who wasn't even talking directly to me, they were just doing a Zoom panel that I was in on, but she was like, um, she said, she was like, um, don't ever think you are above, uh, like that you're above something or that you have done enough of something. You know, um, that's I mean, a word. She said it more eloquently, but. It really, I felt like it was directed to me because I did get to a place and I will be very transparent. I got to a place where I'm like, I'm not doing no more short films. Like I already did all my short films. I, in my mind, I'm just like, I pay my dues. I did all my short films. Like I'm not doing that anymore. Like I'm, I mean, I really was like, I'm above that. Like I'm trying to do other things, you know what I mean? And, she, and obviously she didn't know me, but she said that saying like, you'll continue to do your work because that's how we're finding you all. You know what I mean? Don't ever think you're above doing something that you created that you do. And so right. like, ooh, humble. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay. So I'm not, a, you know, let me not get into that mindset that I'm above doing this work that I really do love. I guess just, you know, you kind of get, not jaded, but a little bit in a sense because you're like, I've done all these things. I've paid my dues. I'm trying to do X, Y, Z now. So. Well, I think that's, True with anything. I remember, like, when I got my first job as a production assistant, and I'm like, I had done all these other little jobs, like, you know, whether in college, post college. It's like, I'm not doing none of that no more. I'm like, little did I know, you production assistant is all those things put together. So I'm running coffees, I'm cleaning, I'm going to get groceries, I'm making, I'm all these other things that that I'm not doing no more. Right. Like, this is the job you're doing. This is the job you're doing. You're like, "Hmm, that's funny. I just said I want to do this no more. Right. So I think, but I think also, like, all those things, like, I had a conversation with a writer the other day and kind of talking about how all those little things definitely help you as a writer in a sense. Like you want to be, I think we get so caught up in like the goal. Yeah. That we forget to pick up all the little things that we're acquiring right. along the way. Because in a sense, like you say, when you're writing, you're building these new worlds. Yeah. So you want to have knowledge of every, like a whole bunch of stuff. You know what I mean? Right. Or even it's like people you meet. I, I think mm-hmm. I, one thing I've learned, like there's no wasted moment. Like everything is happening for a reason in some yeah. capacity. Um, it's like all the people you meet, like literally you you might meet somebody and they might say something that's like, that's a line. That's the, like, that's, yeah. that's just like, I'm it's all coming together. Mm-hmm. I've been taking so much stuff and putting in a script. I said, oh, that's a line. I'd be like, hold on, wait, you said. <laughs> <laughs> or just like situations you find yourself yeah. in, you're like, this is like, am I in a movie right now? What's going on? Seriously, I, I, I tweeted like a couple of months ago, I was like, sometimes I just opt into like, some wild situations just so I can have something in <laughs> the right some material. I'd be like, um, sure, I'll go to this clown convention. <laughs> no, that's one thing about like quarantine. I feel like, although I think I feel like I've been really creative in, during quarantine, part of me is like, nothing is happening, so I have like nothing to write about. Like, I have, there's nothing, I'm in the house, I'm working, like, there's yeah. no, no new things are happening. Um, so I'll be remiss, like, we cannot let this thing in if we didn't talk about this one particular thing that's near and dear to my heart in general. And actually, and I didn't realize I was doing this, but all of my guests have one thing in common so far, and that's that they've all been graduates of historically black colleges and universities. Oh, look at that. And you are an alumnus of Savannah State University. Yeah. Um, so can you just talk? Like, you in Georgia. <laughs> And so you talk about just kind of like just like what is what is that? How does that play a part in your like life? Just like the importance of having that HBCU education. I just um, I think just having that black experience, um, just it was just like it really made me appreciate my culture and my blackness more. You know, more than anything. You know, I'm not gonna lie and say like, you know it's it's an education that you can't get it like you can you can learn what you like you can learn anything from anywhere but right. it's more so the principle of like 
being surrounded by so many black people who are doing great things, who are so, I mean, so many creative black people, like, oh my God, um, it's insane. And just like, it's just a different vibe. It's a whole, it's like, so we have in blackness is so many subcultures. So you got black, and then you got um, hood black, and then you got maybe this kind of black, and then you got HBCU black, and that is like a whole different vibe of blackness. Like, let people start debating HBCUs, or let people start debating bands, or, you know, homecomings, or, you know, Greek life, and stuff like that. It's just, it's just a whole nother culture, and so um, I appreciate that, and then it definitely gave me an idea of black excellence, which, you know. Um, but still, it still made me, made me realize like that I wanted to create worlds that, that, um, kind of depicted this beautiful blackness, you know what I mean? And the people here that I've met at this HBCU, like, wow, you have such a great story. Like I have to depict this on screen or, you know, so yeah, I love HBCUs. I think it's nothing like it. And even I think I always say for me. Um, even though growing up in Atlanta, it's like a black city, you know, you go to black schools, there's always a conversation about, when did you have your first black t-shirt? I'm like, my whole life has been black. Yeah, people so. have been doing that on Twitter, and I've been like, ugh, I'm like, I feel like I'm, I can't join this conversation. Like, school teacher was black, like, everything, <laughs> I was like, ooh, y'all. But oh. even with that, I'm like, there's still something about, because even for me, I always, I always tell people, I didn't want to go to HBCU for that reason. I'm like, I've been, yeah. I've I've done this in a way, but going into like how we're in scene, like you said, there's like a, the, the full spectrum of yes. our community at a different, it's, it's a different, a different experience. You can't even like describe it, you have to like be there and you have do to it. Be there. It's one of those things like you have to be there. It's like, yeah. And, and I, I love so it with that. I love that. Like that. All of the people I've talked to this past few days for the show have all been part of HBCU and, and have succeeded in different ways. Yeah. Cause it's always that conversation, like, well, y'all not gonna really be, su- not, I won't say successful, but there's like, you yeah. are prepared for the real world now. What are you gonna and do? I'm just like, what the, what does that mean? The white world? That's what, <laughs> that's really what they mean when they say that. And it's like, that's, that's not. I saw a tweet that said people will be like, you shouldn't go to an HBCU because it's not diverse, or or doesn't prepare for the real world, but go to a PWI where the diversity is like point zero two. And I'm like, that's awesome. I'm just like, but what? I mean, go, but go off, go, go off. off. Well, it's Twitter. Yeah, it's Twitter. <laughs> um, so as a creator and writer, mm-hmm. what pieces of black cinema and TV are in your life? Bought like these are my movies. Like when it comes, if you had to put together a list, like <laughs> what are those? We, we, we'll say top. We'll do top five, top six. So you can do like three TV, three movies. I have to mix it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, movies. Um, Ease by You. Can I admit that I've never seen Ease by You? And I was, oh, I it's wanted fun. to. It's, I think like they're doing their like appreciation. It's like on Hulu or Netflix yeah. right now. I and I started to watch it and I was like, I'm you got to You got to watch it too. Like, you got to remember, like, it's going to be old looking. Right. You know what I mean? Like, because it's old. And then, like, some stuff, you know. But I love Ease by You. Um, so, Ease by You, Crooklyn. And and also, frequently, I feel like you mentioned that it kind of that was kind of your reference for Sugar Water, right? Yeah, I just loved how like this little girl was so bad at. First of all, East Bayou was a little girl too. Like I was just like, I don't know these these kids like having their own sense of self, and they were just so like these black girls were like, listen, this is not happening, or they like stood up for themselves. I thought that was just so powerful. But um, yeah, Crooklyn, and then it was based in Brooklyn. So I'm like, I want to do something similar in a sense, but just Atlanta. Um, so then Sugar Water. Um, okay, so we said East, East by you, Crooklyn. Crooklyn. Oh my God. And what's and then one more movie. Um Wow. Hmm. I can't think. What's one more? Black cinema. School days. Okay. School days. I literally just rewatched that. Like, I think it's on Netflix now. You just rewatched it. Yeah. Like, I, I loved that movie that. as a kid. I had, we said it on VHS. I don't know. Like, I was like maybe seven, like, watching this movie. I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I like this movie. I think I saw it in high school for the first time. Um, and I was like, what? And then I saw it again in college. We had movie nights. And then I saw it with Spike Lee because he did something at the Fox in Atlanta. I was, I was so there. mad. I, it was so, I was like, everybody was saying the line. 
I was like, well, this is a family reunion. It was so great. I was like, wow, I'm so I glad. Somebody, I've never seen it in like a theater. I would love to see Me it. Either, like. right? So it was such an experience. It was so good. And then Spike Lee got on stage. He was like, if you know the word, say it out loud. Like, sing it. We don't care. Like, we're going to sing it back to the, you know, to the screen. And we did this. <laughs> Listen. Okay, so those are my movies. Um, TV shows. So... I mean, I feel like everybody's just like a different world. I just really loved a different world. But can we just talk about how great of a show that is? I was just watching that last night. I want, yeah, <laughs> like, you know what? I want to rewatch. I want to start over from the very beginning. Um, but it's so great, so great. Um, and then, you know, and this, this is not old, and it's not so. I mean, you know, it's not like a cinema godfather, but. I'm just going to say that That's So Raven was a show that really, like, made me be like, you know, I was, like, excited to see this girl be magical and stuff. You know, this Black girl be magical on screen. So I'm just still... And it's not about her initially being the Black girl. It's just her. It's just her friends. And her, and, you know, her family. So I thought that that was worth something. And then um, one-on-one, like, I really liked one-on-one. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm up, I literally I always say this about people, my friends. People just think I'll be playing. I, people need to give Kyla Pratt her flowers for just this. Serious. I feel like in that era of like artists, like, could you, I feel like, well, I mean, for obvious reasons, there's always in the class of actresses, there's like the black girl. I feel like they gave that to Raven. But yes. Kyla was working in that stuff. She was working. She was she on Proud Family 101. Dr. Doolittle. I mean, she was on a lot. You know, Proud Family too. Like, I mean, I know we had mentioned animated films, but that was like, well, that wasn't a first black one I saw. What was the first black animated film you saw? I think Ooh. my friend Martin, you know, they did that oh. Martin the King. <laughs> I mean, it was good, but like, I don't remember, outside of that, I really don't remember. That's my friend Martin. I my love. friend Martin, I've seen that in um, elementary, no. Every, if you ain't seen that, I used to go watch that. That's what she used to watch today. <laughs> Like, yeah. No, but I think I need Kyle to get her, get her flowers. I love to see, I love that she was on Insecure this season. Yeah. I, like, I, I think she, I just like her as an actress, her spirit, as an entertainer. I thought um, so know. before we go, I have a lightning round of questions. So my show is all about not just talking about like, you know, the black woes that we all have, the trauma, mm-hmm. but also about showing like the black joy. Yes, we, like, we, like we talk about, we are full dimensional people. We yes. have full character arcs. My yes. the best friend on screen. Yes. Okay. Um, so first question, what do you love most about black people? Um, our, this unspoken like language and understanding that we have. Like we, you know, the, the experience, like we all have experienced like some of the same thing. It's just crazy. Like how we'll get on Twitter and somebody say, anybody else mama did X, Y, Z? And we'd be like, yes, yeah. what the heck? We don't even know each other. So I feel like this unspoken connection that we have Okay, so right now it's summertime, as you know. Um, what are you in charge of to bring to the cookout? Um, banana pudding. Okay, is it homemade banana pudding, or you it's went homemade. to the store? It's home. It's homemade banana pudding. Let's, but, you, but you laugh. Y'all do that sometimes. Y'all let us try to go to the store real quick and try to switch the bowls. <laughs> like That's you don't like know. Stuff I would do if I was being lazy, not because I can't <laughs> cook it, because I would forgot about it. Like I'm such a person. Like, oh, I forgot. Let me go to the store. <laughs> but no, I can make some real good banana pudding. Put in. Everybody in my HBC is to be in my house, my dorm, my house, whatever. <laughs> um, getting my banana pudding. So yes. Okay. So uh I love that this these these kind of circulate every time on black Twitter or the internet, uh like your favorite black proverb. So mine is if you can hum, you can hear. That's my favorite black proverb. So what is your favorite black proverb? My favorite black proverb is what is it? <laughs> Um, dang, if you can hang here, it's so good. Absolutely. And it's, a, and it, and it's going back to your first point that, you know, we are the unspoken language. Me and my, one of my other black coworkers, um, we were working in news. We had saw this, uh, saw and we like bust out laughing. And one of our other coworkers, she was, um, Latinx. She was like, I don't get it. I don't get it. We right. like, if you can hum, you can hear. Right. I think it's like, do you have McDonald's money? I think that's just, that, that count, like, I say that today in reference to anything. Like, somebody will be like, um, can we, we, we just need to get this other location. I'd be like, do you have McDonald's money? No. They know exactly what they mean. Like, you ain't even, you're not paying for this. So we're not going to do this. So I think I really like that. Do you have McDonald's money? I feel like that's classic. That's classic. <laughs> um, what, who is a black person that you want to shine a light on today? Um, any black person? Any black person. 
Who do I want to shine a light on today? Um, wow, so many black people. I want to shine a light on um, ah! um, Nina, our friend Nina. So she, do you remember Nina? We were about to, um, we were doing like Southern Fried Rice together. Yes, Nina, okay. She has a, a web series that's so good. I haven't finished watching it, but it's so good. So I want to shine a light on her because I appreciate her artistry and her humor and her, com her comedic timing and things of that nature. And I think she's brilliant. Okay, I love it, love it, love it. Um, what is your favorite lyric or song by a Black artist? Oh my God, first of all, I have so many. Um, oh my God, this is like, you know how many black artists there are? I know, but everybody got that one line when they come on you like. Eh, 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 eh. I'm gonna just say this because. <laughs> I'm gonna say this only because I, my friend just put it on my, my stories and it's top of mind. But I do always say top notch hoes get the most, not the lesser. And I know it sounds ratchet, but it's really motivational. It's basically inspiring you to be the best you can be because you will then in turn reap what you sow by being the best. Hello, come, come on, on somebody. You wrap that thing up. Come on, I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, what, is, <laughs> what is your hope for Black people? My hope for Black people is to, first of all, reparations. How about that? And um, I mean, my check today. Today, outside of that, my hope is that we continue to um, be joyful. We continue to fight for one one another. We continue to stand up for one another, and we continue to shine how we always do in our art, in our work, in our style, in our swag, in our talk, and in our in our love for one another. So, like that is my greatest hope that we continue to be black and proud. All right, and last but not least, what brings you black joy? Um, I think uh, other black joy, like just seeing uh, seeing black kids play, really gives me joy. Like I'd be like, oh my god, yes, just be a kid. Like you, you know what I mean. And then we take that for granted. Um, and then also just black love. I love seeing it. I love swooning over it. Very novella. Like I'm like, Ugh. and then I want to see like. I want to say black women, just black women, just having a good time, black people dancing, everything, like everything that brings black people, other black people joy, literally brings me joy. Like I can like literally sit and just watch people dance and be like. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. Okay, so Nakia, where can people follow you, stay up to date with everything damn right originals on socials, on like the website, all those different things. You all can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at ScreenWriteHer, so that's ScreenWrite, H-E-R, underscore. And then um, Damn Right Originals, our website is www.damnrightoriginals.com. That's right as in penmanship, W-R-I-T-E, so damn as in damn, right, originals, with an S, dot com. And then you can also find us on Instagram at Damn Right Originals, and then Twitter at DW Originals. And um, yeah. Do you guys have anything coming out soon or anything, projects you want to plug? We have a, a project. Oh, so our one of our short films, Trey, is now on Apple TV and I think Amazon. It's on Amazon too. We just posted about it. So like go check because I just could be just saying stuff. But it's on Apple TV for sure. And it's for free. So definitely check it out. Um, I, I wrote it last year for around Father's Day. Um, and uh, so now it's finally free for people to watch. So go check that out. And then also on Aspire TV, um, Endangered, our new film, which really creepily reflects the times. And I wrote it a while ago. So it's just, it's just very, it's very eerie kind of, but um, Endangered is on, it will be on Aspire TV in July. So watch out for our post about it. Cause I don't remember the exact date, but Endangered. And you also got, you guys have some really cool, like, merch that people can also buy. Oh, yes. Look, I'm wearing Are you wearing a shirt? Right now? Yes. Okay. Queen Pen, it's probably backwards. But um, Queen Pen, we have our merch. You can go to our link in our bio on Instagram, and it'll it'll say, like, buy, buy some damn merch. You can go there. You can support us. All the proceeds go to uh, dope black filmmakers, whether it's people within Damn Right or people outside of Damn Right. We've donated to so many different people's Indiegogo campaigns using the, the money that we made from um, 
from our merch and we've sent some people money who were in film school abroad using that money so like it definitely goes to help filmmakers Black yeah so guys buy a shirt buy y'all, it's, y'all need a t-shirt anyway you know yeah, so we fall we might be outside by then so <laughs> let's buy buy some sweatshirts no definitely um, but thank you, Nakia. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, the support is always real. You know, support for Black artists, Black filmmakers, Black writers. Um, and I really do appreciate this from the bottom of my heart. Yes, thank you, Jeremiah. And thank you to Adam and Content. Like, shout out to everybody here. So this is fun. Thank you so much.